Okay. Can I have everyone's attention? We'll try to get back to our time so that you can get out of here later. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank H&E Publishers uh, for coming and manning the table. We, we were unable to uh, get the people that we usually have uh, to come. Uh, that's Parasource from Paris, Ontario. And so uh, we called H&E uh, up about two weeks ago and they said, yes, uh, we, we can come. And so uh, I noticed there are some really good books and a number of you have purchased them. So thank you to them. All right, Dr. Griffiths, up for another one, the last one. And then we'll have a brief Q&A once he's finished. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. What a joy it is. You're a very long-suffering people. This has been great fun for me, and I'm grateful to see that um, you are persevering. Thank you for that. We are going to spend this final session considering how it is that we may reach, in the kindness of God, the heart of the hearer. And as we approach that, let's turn to the Lord and ask for his gracious help. Our Father, we know that the message of your word impacts the heart and gives shape to the eternity of those who hear. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to learn to be faithful communicators of your word such that the heart is indeed reached and lives are transformed both for time and eternity, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When it comes to the matter of convictions, surrounding preaching, I tend to find that people exist along a spectrum. At one end are the people who have the conviction that preaching is essentially a matter of information transfer, and we've referenced this already. There is truth in the text. A preacher is a Bible teacher whose job it is to get the truth of the text communicated uh, clearly and understandably to the hearer. At the other end of the spectrum, there will be those who think that preaching is a moment of divine encounter of some kind. In faithful preaching, there will be a spiritual and likely an emotional experience for the hearer, whereby they will come to feel that they have met with the living God. Both groups are, of course, right on some levels. There is a sense of encounter with God through preaching. It is a divine and spiritual event, but it is so because of the way in which God speaks and acts through his word and because of the way in which he is particularly pleased to act through the preaching of his word. Now, if we have that kind of conviction, we will believe that we are rightly aiming to impact not simply the mind and the understanding of the hearer, but through the mind we want to reach the heart and shape the affections and the will, ultimately, that there might be life change to the glory of God. Context, which we focused on in the last lecture, is absolutely key, I believe, to preaching that engages the heart. I've been seeing this myself more and more. I have become more and more convinced of it over time as I've gone on in my own preaching and sought to learn more about preaching. Bible books were written into real situations, speak to real people, to address real challenges and real needs. It is easier to see the life situation and to get a sense of it in some Bible books than it is in other Bible books. The letters of the New Testament, the epistles are particularly helpful here. They are very definitely, aren't they, occasional literature. That is, they are written into an occasion, into a situation, into a story. They are generally and more specifically crisis literature. They are often written into a crisis. And I think it is very, very helpful insofar as we are able, especially when it comes to preaching the epistles, to try and identify the crisis which gives life to the epistle, that gives life to its message, and will enable us to preach it in a way that I believe will reach the heart. So um, let me just mention a couple of these. We, we can't do a deep dive on any epistle in particular, but let me just mention a couple of things here for you to reflect upon. Titus. 
which is a wonderful letter, and I love to teach Titus. We often use it in our ministry training endeavors as a, as a practice book because it's so helpful to learn about uh, preaching from Titus, I think. But, you know, there are sections of Titus which we can struggle to know what to do with in the context of pulpit ministry, and I think in particular of the discussion of elders and qualifications for elders in chapter 1. That is not easy preaching. I'm sure many of you have preached it. And you come to that, and I think we think instinctively, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, this is going to be a little bit dry. I mean, it's important. We know it's important. And we need to have this, you know, this text referenced in our bylaws and things like that for qualifications of leaders. But preaching it, it's going to be a bit dry. You know, this is why I left you in Crete so that you might put in what remained in order and appoint elders in every town. If anyone's above reproach, husband to one wife, so on and so on and so on. It's familiar. It can seem rather dry. How do we preach it? How do we reach the heart with this kind of material within the text? Well, we need to ask, what is the issue here? What, what is the crisis that is being addressed? And how does this block of teaching speak into the crisis and provide something of a solution? Asking that question brings things to life, and it will often give us our edge of application. Well, what's going on in Crete, it, it, the place where Titus has been left to minister for a time? Well, he's, he's ministering in a rotten culture. Verse 12, one of the Cretans a prophet of their own has said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. What do you really think about them, Paul? Come on, don't hold back. <laughs> Rotten culture. It's a, new, it's a new church. Things haven't been put all in order yet. Uh, Titus has been left there to finish off the job. They have the gospel. That's interesting. They've got the gospel, but they don't have the contours fully of the Christian life. So you'll notice the great... Um, train of ethical teaching in chapter 2 has the engine at the back and not at the front. Have you ever noticed that about Titus 2? So Titus 2, telling Titus what he needs to be teaching, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And you would think he's going into some ethics there and some dynamics of church life. You think, well, start with the gospel, start with the sound doctrine of the gospel, and then teach the ethics and so on and the practice that flows from it. Well, no, he starts with the ethics and the practice, and he doesn't get to the gospel till verse 11. The engine comes at the end. Why does he do that? Because in Crete, this new church has been evangelized pretty well. They've got the gospel, but what they don't have and what they really need now is to hear some of the implications of the gospel, some ethics and some dynamics of church life. So young church, new church, rotten culture, vulnerable, wolves are all around. Verse 10, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They need to be silenced, upsetting whole families. There are silly controversies going around. Verse 9, avoid those foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, etc. Avoid the people who stir up strife and division because there are people like that around. Verse 10 of chapter 3. As for a person who stirs up division after warning once, warning him twice. Okay, so we've, we've given about 30 seconds there to some of the issues, some of the crisis, what's going on in Crete, what the, what the culture in which the people are swimming, we come back to the elder discussion. Why does this matter? Is this not just for the bylaws and for some committee to give attention to? Well, no, this is a crisis, you see, because the church is unprotected. The church is unprotected. And until an eldership of this kind and of this character and of this caliber are put in place, the church will not be a complete church. And they may have the gospel, but they won't last very long. You see, the complete church is one with an eldership that is godly like this, that holds to sound doctrine and lives out sound doctrine in godly character, unlike the false teachers who are ungodly people and and, and teach ungodly doctrine. For the church to be complete, for the church to be secure, for the church to be finished, for the church to be a real church and a whole church, it needs people like this in leadership. And so do we. And the text comes to life once we've considered the crisis and the issue and the background and a bit of the context. The the crisis in the New Testament epistles needs to be identified if if, if the epistle is going to be preached. Hebrews, we spent some time in Hebrews. Let's just think about Hebrews for a minute. Lots of Christology here, very rich. Lots on priesthood, lots on sacrifice, lots on sacred space, 
on sanctuary, on tabernacle, and so on. Rich and deep, maybe a little bit heavy, not easy preaching. Lots of people shy away from Hebrews. People easily get overwhelmed and lost. But it is not a work of abstract and dry theology, right? It's not its purpose. No, Hebrews is an urgent pastoral appeal. And if we teach the theology, we teach the Christology, we teach the symbolism without rooting it in the pastoral crisis, it is going to be very dry, very boring, very abstract, very unedifying. So what's the crisis? Well, chapter 2 opens it up quite nicely. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? There's a danger of drifting, of stopping listening to Jesus and to his gospel message. And we're aware of the other famous warning passages, and we won't open them up, of course, but there's some of the hardest preaching in the New Testament in chapter 6 and chapter 10, the warning passages. And there is this concern that the writer has for the spiritual good of the people to whom he is writing. And as we look at the nature of the teaching given, we can begin to get a little bit of a sense cumulatively of the nature of the pressures. The background to the teaching is very Jewish. It's very Old Testament. It's rooted in the uh, practice of Judaism, of Old Testament religion. There's a danger that these people are going to be drawn away uh, from Jesus to something else. And it becomes pretty clear that what they are grappling with is the institutions and practices of Old Testament religion. Seems pretty clear that they are receiving suggestions that their faith isn't valid, isn't real. That they need to return to the temple, to the priesthood, to sacrifice, to the old system. And so what is the the solution to their drift? What is the way in which the writer proposes to bring them back? He gives them a very grand view of the Lord Jesus Christ, of who he is as greater than every institution and office and symbol of the old system. This is not an abstract thing. How how do you help drifting people to come back to Jesus and to stay close with Jesus, to stick with Jesus in the long run? You give them a grand and glorious picture of who Jesus is. And so the bigness of the Christology and the grandeur of the presentation of Jesus Christ is not so that people can go away and ace a theology or a Christology exam. It's so that they won't drift away from Jesus. And we start thinking, okay, what is it that might cause my people to be drifting away from Jesus? What is it that's drawing them away? What in the culture? What in, uh, you know, in, in, in other religious people? What are the pressures that are drawing them away or telling them that this isn't sufficient or true or real or substantial? And then how do I find the point of contact and show them that Jesus is wonderful and Jesus is everything and Jesus is all they need? In the epistles, we... In order to root the thing contextually, we think about the broader issue for the church and the addressees. We think about the crisis. It's very, very important to have an idea of the contextual situation, the crisis, when we come to preach the epistles. In the Gospels, just to take another genre, this functions on a different level. The dynamics are a little bit different. We don't want to fall into the trap, I don't think, of trying to reconstruct a Mathean community, for instance, or a Markan community, as scholars of an earlier generation did so much, trying to imagine who it was to whom these documents or for whom these documents were written and then imagine their life situation. We're not given that in the Gospels. It's not contextualized in that way, like the epistles. And I think we can get very, very lost trying to do too much of that. No, in the Gospels, I think we give thought to the dynamics within the narrative how it is the the ministry of Jesus, his words and his works are impacting the people within the narrative. We don't think so much about reader response, I don't think, in the first instance. I think we think of the immediate response of those standing before Jesus, to Jesus, his person and his words and his works. We don't try and find our point of connection with the first readers of the document, but with those who first encountered Jesus within the document. So to take an example, 
Uh, I, I'm preaching Matthew's gospel right now, so I only take this simply because I happen to be in it. But um, in Matthew 14 and 15, it's quite interesting. You've got two sets of feedings, the feeding miracles. You've got the, the 5,000 in Matthew 14 and the 4,000 in Matthew 15. And I, I recently preached both of these, and I found myself thinking, when I got to the second one, this is going to be rather repetitive. And I found myself wondering, what exactly is the issue here? Why, is this, why does Jesus do this? Why does Matthew record it for us twice? What do we do with it? Chapter 15, the uh, healing miracles, um, and then a feeding miracle, which repeats basically what happened in chapter 14, could, could be a very, very difficult preach. And I found myself wondering, where is the connection point? Where is the spark of engagement here? What is the story all about? Well, I think we need to consider the flow of the story and the experience of the people engaging with Jesus in, you know, in the flow of this and in the development of it. So I won't go into great detail here, and you'll be familiar with these narratives, but it's quite clear in chapter 14, I think, that the feeding miracle there takes place within a primarily Jewish context. Jesus feeds those who are before him. Uh, he has compassion on them. They eat all that they need. There are 12 baskets left over of food, uh, and it's symbolic for the fullness of the people of God uh, receiving all that is needed. We think of the 12 tribes of Israel, and then we've got the walking on the water, the, the healing of the sick in Gennesaret. And it's, it's, all, it's all very, very wonderful. And that is very preachable first time round. We come to chapter 15, and it's interesting. Jesus has this very unfortunate engagement with the Pharisees and the scribes who come to him from Jerusalem in chapter 15. And they see nothing of what Jesus is doing. They're totally blind to it. And they have a superficial and silly discussion about the washing of hands. Jesus talks to them then about the true nature of defilement that comes from the heart and sin, but they don't understand any of that. Uh, he then is approached by a Canaanite woman in the region of Tyre and Sidon, gen Gentile territory in the north. And she comes, she recognizes Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, calling him son of David in verse 22. The Jewish leaders got none of that. They certainly didn't address him that way. She says, could you help because my daughter is... Uh, demonized. Um, so here we have a Gentile woman from a very Gentile region with a daughter who has the defilement of demonic possession. So unclean in every way in Jewish eyes, right? In every respect. And she comes and she, she says, Lord, help me. She comes in just the right way. But Jesus says, not right to verse 26, take the children's bread, throw it to the dogs, Gentile dogs. She said, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, oh, woman, great is your faith. And he, and, and he meets her need. It's a real turning point with, in terms of Jew-Gentile relations here. The profound blindness of the Jewish leaders and then this extraordinary Gentile woman who responds to him as the Messiah of Israel. It's a beautiful thing. Then we get another healing miracle. And we think, in fact, a set of them, we think, okay, I preached that recently. Okay, verse 29, what do I do here? It's interesting the way in which this summary is presented. Jesus went on from there and went beside the Sea of Galilee. It's pretty clear he went down the, the other side, the east side. We're told that this is a, a desolate area later in verse 33. It's pretty clear it's the eastern, it's the eastern side. Um, when the healing takes place, the people... Matthew tells us, verse 31, glorify the God of Israel. And that makes sense if it's Gentiles glorifying the God of Israel. That's a striking thing. If it was just Jew Jewish people glorifying God, it would be they glorify God, um, but the God of Israel. The feeding miracle is interesting in the way it's presented. Great crowds came to bring with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. When we hear a summary like that of the healing miracles of Jesus, we are prompted, I think, very directly to consider one of the most famous uh, promises of restoration within the, the, the age of the Messiah in Isaiah 35, familiar territory, but it so mirrors the presentation of that promise for what the, the Messiah would do for the, day, for the day of restoration and rescue when the Lord himself comes. Isaiah 35 and verse 5, we know this, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy, waters break and forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. 
what we've got is one of the great promises of messianic restoration for Israel being fulfilled among the Gentiles. It's a remarkable thing. And the Gentiles see that something remarkable is happening and they glorify the God of Israel when he does this for them. Then we go to the feeding of the 4,000 and it's like the last one, very similar. And we think I preached this. I had some good illustrations. I thought I did a rather nice job of it last time. I don't have anything fresh. But we think about it and we notice some small details. The number of baskets taken up at the end is seven this time, not 12. And seven takes us back not to the founding of the nation of Israel, not to the 12 tribes, but to the work of creation. Six days of creating and seven rest, perfection, fullness. Something very, very ultimate and whole about that. And we start thinking about bread. Start thinking about bread. And we recognize that there was a feeding for Israel that took place in chapter 14. And then there was a Gentile woman who came to Jesus and said, would you, would you help me? And Jesus said, the bread is not for the dogs. And she said, would you give me a crumb? And Jesus says, okay. And then he turns around and he gives the Gentiles more bread than they know what to do with so that there are seven baskets left over. And what's the story? What's the meaning? What's the impact? The saving work of Jesus is wider and deeper and greater and fuller than we can ever imagine. It's for everyone. The invitation is there. The meal is prepared. The banquet is set. Everyone's invited. No one need be excluded if they will but come like the Gentile woman comes and says, oh Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. And so suddenly the second one is profoundly meaningful. As we're experiencing the text in the back and forth of its own flow and asking, what is the issue here? Why is this so meaningful? What is, the, what is the issue, the crisis that's being addressed? Well, it is the blindness of the Jewish leaders. It is the, the need of the Gentile people. It is the faith of this, the extraordinary faith of this Canaanite woman. It is the grace and mercy of Jesus to reach beyond any bound that anyone would have ever imagined, even to those who are utterly beyond the pale, totally defiled. He, there, there's room at the banquet for them. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. But it takes a bit of sitting in the story, doesn't it? It takes a bit of standing back and just asking, what is the issue with this text? And there has to be that process of standing back from the deep, the precise exegetical details. And there are fun little details, like the word for basket is, you know this, I'm sure. The word for basket is different in the two stories. Wayne knows. The word for basket is different in the two stories. Um, you know, the first one is more typically used in a Jewish context for carrying kosher food. This one is a big, ba big basket for, in chapter 15 and much more generic. So it's interesting, but, but we need to consider the flow of the story. What is the crisis? What is the issue? Stand back from the precise exegetical de uh, details and ask, ask the question. Now, uh, context, identifying the crisis, identifying the issue, I think that's very, very key for helping us reach the heart in preaching. And that kind of preaching does reach the heart when we do that kind of hard work with the Spirit's help. We've got a very few minutes uh, remaining. And with this concern for preaching to the heart in mind, I wanted to highlight for you, just for a bit of fun, some danger zones in preaching. And just because this is right near the end and everyone's tired, I've taken the liberty of alliterating these. So there we go. Having given you very heavy and long headings before, I've got short ones and they alliterate. So that is my gift to you. Um, danger zone number one, rushing to relevance rushing to relevance. My instinct as a preacher is to read a passage of Scripture and ask immediately, how does this impact my congregation? Where is the point of contact? Where does this sort of bite? How is it relevant? That's not a wrong instinct, by the way. If we don't care about those questions at all, our preaching is going to be pretty dull. But let me say this, rushing to relevance will not actually serve us very well. We may make some initial headway in engaging our hearers if we're touching on issues 
that are important for them, but the impact of a forced relevance upon the text will be short-lived because we will be bypassing the true meaning of the text and the power of the word of God. Now, I think we do this a lot as Bible teachers, but it is actually a faith issue. You see, the kind of approach that says, I'm not sure the text is relevant, but I'm going to find a relevance for it. I'm going to create one rather than see what the text is actually doing for relevance. I mean, Matthew 14, 15, the text is doing something very, very relevant, but we've got to dig in the text to find it, right? But if I superimpose an issue upon the text that I think will be relevant for people, uh, it's actually betraying a lack of faith on my part. That kind of approach stems from a belief that what the text actually has to say is not very relevant, not very engaging, not very interesting. And so to be relevant, engaging, interesting as a preacher, I've got to impose relevance upon the text. And what I want to say is the text is relevant, but to see it come alive, we've got to do the hard work on the text. And it does come alive. It yields its treasure, but it takes a little bit of time. A friend was just saying to me that um, when, you, when you go digging for gold in, in some of the mines in this region, it's thought that to get an ounce of gold, you need to move, what is it, three tons of dirt or something like that? You've got to do a lot of digging for the gold. And in preaching, it's a bit like that, isn't it? But rushing to find the, the relevance that is going to sort of scratch an itch for people uh, is a very undermining exercise. Rushing to relevance, number two, forcing your framework. We all have our own theological grid or, or framework, and we all have our own favorite emphases. That is inevitable. It is no bad thing. But the danger is that you and I can become framework preachers when we preach our framework rather than the text. There are two types of framework that we can impose upon the text. One will be the fa framework of our favorite emphases and hobby horses, and the other will be the framework of our systematic theology. My friend David Jackman on likes to tell the fictional story of Pastor Fred. Okay, let me tell you about Pastor Fred. Pastor Fred has had a bad week. He had two extra funerals and a few pastoral emergencies. He gets down to his prep, although he intended to start on Monday morning, he gets down to work on Saturday morning for his Sunday sermon. He views it as being exceptional, but if we actually look back at the last few weeks, months, and years of his ministry, this is what Pastor Fred actually always does. Pastor Fred thinks of himself as an expositor, as many people do, and he works through books of the Bible. He's going through 2 Timothy at the moment, and he gets to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, and he's delighted. This is Saturday morning. He wants to play golf still, and so he knows that time is tight, and uh, he looks at it, and he reads it, you then might shall be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and he's, he's delighted because he sees that the word grace is in there. Ch uh, Pastor Fred, unfortunately, does not have much of a sense of what uh, verse 1 of chapter 2 may have in connection with what came before in chapter 1. He doesn't have much idea what it means to be strengthened by grace or what it means that this grace is in Christ Jesus. He doesn't see any connection really between that grace and the teaching of chapter 2 and verse 2 to entrust what Timothy has heard from Paul to faithful men. But here is the thing. He does have some very wonderful reflections on the theme of grace. He's got his, his acronym, G-R-A-C-E. Huh. God's riches at Christ's expense. That is wonderful, and it's six and a half minutes from last time he used it. Great. He remembers that uh, Philip Yancey had some, something good on how amazing grace is in some book or other. He figures there is a story he can share from that book. He has turned to his concordance, and he has found five wonderful cross-references on the theme of grace. And when he adds up the G-R-A-C-E and the Philip Yancey quote and the five cross-references, he's got 17 and a half minutes, and he's got tea time in 30 minutes, and so he's off. That is bingo, a sermon. And it is more or less the same way every week. Spurgeon said of the preachers of his day, 10,000 Thousands are their texts, but all their sermons won. And that is the danger of the hobby horse, the favorite theme preacher. That's Pastor Fred. The other type of framework we can bring is the framework of our own systematic theology. We find a hint in the text that points us to our favorite doctrine, whatever it is, 
and we're off into the deep woods of the systematic theology of that doctrine and the theme and the aim of the passage, it's true pastoral intent. Those things are well and truly in the dust because we are off with our systematics. Now, we bring our frameworks. Of course we do. We need to think doctrinally as Bible teachers, but our theological framework must be in constant dialogue with the text, constantly being reshaped by the text of Scripture itself. If that is not happening, our preaching and our teaching will be repetitive. They will be very, very boring. But here's the thing. The text will keep us fresh if we are mining, if we're being honest with the text all the time. Here's another one, coddling the consumer. The preacher is under huge pressure to satisfy the consumer instinct within the hearer. Huge pressure. And the way to do that simply and easily is to be a felt needs preacher. That is to try and figure out what it is that is most bothering people at the minute, what is their greatest problem or need, and to focus the sermon every week upon their need. This will be initially greeted by people and greatly appreciated. And it will probably increase church numbers for a time. There is a huge enticement for us to be felt needs consumer-driven preachers. There are a number of problems with doing this. Number one, we won't be preaching the text. We will be consistently manipulating the text to meet the needs of the people, the felt needs of the people. Number two, we won't be proclaiming Christ. We will make every text about us, and Jesus simply becomes our therapist who assists us, rather than the Savior who rescues us and the Lord who reigns. Number three, there will not be long-term fruit, because the power is in the Word, not in our superficial attempts at therapy. Number four, we will gather around us over time a very self-focused, self-obsessed group of people, not your ideal congregation, I would submit to you. But I will say at the same time, here's another danger zone in preaching, neglecting the needy. Neglecting the needy. All that having been said, we could have uh, such a reaction to felt needs preaching that we go in the other direction, and I have seen this, and almost do our best to ignore the people in front of us as we declare the word of God vaguely in their direction. I think I've seen this happen. Where, where the, the, the preacher has seen bad felt needs preaching, has, has been revulsed by it, and so makes a point of not addressing any of the needs of the people, save their need to escape hell in the end. Now, how do we find a balance of faithfulness? That's a, that's a big question, actually. That's a very searching question for the preacher. How do we get this right? Well, I think we look to Jesus. That's what I've concluded. Uh, and I'm interested, again, in the miracles of Jesus. I've been reflecting on this quite deeply personally as I've been preaching through Matthew's gospel. You know, again, there in chapter 14 and 15, I, I was thinking about this, actually, as I came to the bit on, you know, Jesus walking on water and uh, feeding the 5,000 and healing the sick in Gennesaret. And what I, what I notice about the Lord Jesus Christ with the miracles, with his earthly ministry, is that everything is targeted at the cross. So all of those miracles, ultimately, and all of those actions are revealing his identity as the divine son, the Messiah of Israel, the savior of the world. All of them are symbolically driving us to the cross. All of the healing miracles you know, the, 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 broken, the, the broken bodies that will be restored ultimately through the, the atoning work at Calvary and through the resurrection, the defilements that will be cleansed through the shedding of his blood. All of these things point us to the cross, all of it. And we could look at each type of miracle and how they all point to the cross. They all do. He's driving them there. But as he drives them to the cross and takes them beyond their felt needs, he doesn't ignore their felt needs. He sees that they are a people who are suffering and a people who are needy in every respect. And it is so lovely, isn't it, how he addresses the particular presenting need, but as he addresses it, he takes them to the cross. It's not a one or other for Jesus. And so I think it is right to proclaim Christ as the one who has compassion on the needy in every respect, 
we do bring our needs to Jesus. We bring our burdens to Jesus. We bring all that is weighing us down and all that is overwhelming us. We come to Jesus and he is sufficient for all of us, but he is there not simply to relieve temporal suffering, but to relieve eternal suffering. And we take them all the way to the cross without bypassing our listeners as people. And to get that right, well, may the Lord help us. It's a challenge, but I think it is our calling. I'm conscious of time. Is this about the right Q&A time? I'm, I'm, I, I can keep going. I have more alliteration, actually. So five more minutes. I can do five more, brother. As long as you tell me to go, I'm very, very glad to do that. Leaving the line. Leaving the line. This idea goes back to Dick Lucas in London, although there are lots of different versions of this around, actually, and no one is quite sure which one Dick actually meant in the original. But in my version of this, anyway, what we're talking about is the line of doctrinal orthodoxy. I'm not a visual learner, by the way. Some of you might be. Um, but for those who are visual learners, I have, a, I have a visual illustration where you can imagine a whiteboard here or something on the machine, and, and you've got a blank sheet, and you've got a line, okay? That is my illustration, a straight line, horizontal line. Okay, just picture that if you could. That's my, that's my great visual aid. We don't want to leave it. We don't want to go above it or below it. And what I mean here is the line of doctrinal orthodoxy. So God's word is truth. God's word establishes the standard of doctrinal orthodoxy. If we've read or understood any given text of Scripture properly, it will set for us the position of doctrinal orthodoxy on any issue as we speak to it. Now, our constant danger is that we will misread or misapply Scripture so that we will go above the line into religious pietism, legalism, or outright fanaticism. We will over-apply the text, if you like. We'll go beyond what it's saying, above what it's calling for. Or, in the other direction, we can dip below the line into liberalism and pragmatism. Now, we could take time and illustrate this from lots of different texts. I don't think I will at this point. But what I will say is this. My experience is that most people have a natural tendency to either push above the line all the time or to dip below the line all the time. You know, the scripture says this, but I want to be really zealous, so I'm going to go above and beyond. I'm going to be a bit pharisaical, okay? And I'm going to call for more. Or the scripture says this, but uh, I don't know. People are going to be a bit offended. Look, let's put it like this, and I think it'll be okay. And my encouragement to you is trying to figure out which kind you are. What is your natural tendency and have in mind all the time to say, where is the line of orthodoxy in this text? What is scripture calling for? I want to say no more and no less than what the scripture says. Don't leave the line. Not above, not below. I think it's a very helpful reminder. Uh, exegeting everything. Exegeting everything. We need to exegete everything in the study, but we don't try and do it in the pulpit. Remember when I had my first job, I mentioned to you the application process of that. I remember it, it was a church where we had a morning and an evening service. The senior minister basically wanted me to come, come on staff and do about half the preaching. I was, I was totally fresh. I had no experience preaching. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but he was very gracious, and he sort of set me loose in the pulpit a little bit. And, um, but he, he spent time with me giving me feedback. So I remember we were in Genesis in my first few months there. He assigned me, I think, Genesis 8 to preach, and I went for it, I'll tell you. I, I exegeted that thing, and I found every single issue. I was into abortion. I was into euthanasia. I, was into, I just got into everything, and I went for it. My, my um, sermon manuscript, I was manuscripting, as I still do, actually, and I, I, was it 5,000 words or 6,000 words? I can't remember. In Britain, they like short sermons, and this was not a short sermon, and my boss, he was a real English gentleman. He was a very delightful man, still a friend. And uh, I remember he sat me down for my feedback session. Okay, we sat down on Monday or Tuesday or whatever it is. And you know how the, how the English, um, you don't say things directly. Um, and one has to read between the lines a little bit. And you say things very politely, but one needs to understand what's really being said. And I remember he sat me down and he said, well, that was, um, 
That was very comprehensive. <laughs> huh. And I, I, was, huh. I was naive enough for a few minutes to take that as a compliment. Huh. Huh. <laughs> but he then, um, he then sent me home with some VHS tapes. VHS, okay, so that dates me a little bit. Some VHS tapes um, that were actually produced in Sydney in Australia by the Anglican diocese there, which is very evangelical. Uh, they were sermon. They were um, some instructional cassettes uh, produced by the diocesan evangelist, who was a man by the name of John Chapman, who's very well known, who used to be given the job of training the young preachers because he was the best communicator in the diocese. And so the young trainees would have to sit down with Chapo, as they they, they called him, and learn something about communication. And I just remember, and I realized this was the moment in the, I think there were three cassettes that, that I was meant to pay attention to. Um, again, very subtly done, but it was effective. Um, and, and, and Chapo said to these students, look, take, take a passage of scripture. Uh, you know, I think this was something, if I remember rightly, this is a while ago, but you know, I think it was Romans, something from Romans 3 on justification, righteousness through faith, you know, 321 to 26, that famous passage. And he said to them, okay, look, imagine you were teaching this in a, in a few different contexts. So you're, you're teaching these few verses to uh, theological students at, at our diocesan college, which is Moore College in Sydney, quite a well-known seminary. Um, imagine you're teaching this to New Testament students at Moore College. They know their Greek. They know their stuff. You've got a morning, maybe three hours. You're going through this text. What percentage of the theological substance of the text do you try and communicate in your three hours? And, you know, they tried some things, and I think they sort of said, you know, 90%. High, right? You really go for it with your students. And um, so that, you know, that, that's, that's one thing. And then he says, look, you've got a small group Bible study, and, uh, you know, you've got a group of people who are mature Christians. They gather on a Wednesday night. They set apart the night. They do their preparation, and they... Uh, are, are spending a couple hours around this text. What percentage of the theological substance of the text do you try and communicate in that context? And, you know, they said, look, 50, 60 percent. Okay, that sounds reasonable. You're preaching this on a Sunday morning to a mixed congregation, whoever floats in through the door, the church doors on a Sunday morning. What percentage of the theological substance of the text do you try and communicate in that context? And they tried various things. And the number they landed on, the number he wanted them to land on was 20 percent. And what was the point? And that was what I needed to hear, by the way. I needed to hear that because I thought that faithfulness meant saying 100% every time. And his point was, you, you can say 100% or you can try to, but you won't communicate 100%. And what matters is what you can actually get across. And we need to give ourselves permission to communicate what is at the heart of the text, but not give every exegetical detail of the text or we will we will burden our people and we will bore our people. Speaking of which, I must stop. Okay. <laughs> I think we have Q&A or not. How far ahead do you go? And, and you know, Tuesday morning, do you sit down? Or how does it look? The reality, I mean, the, the, you know, the best laid plans. Um, the reality is that life is messy and things interrupt all the time. What I try and do as a basic rule is I, I, I don't take many meetings in the morning. I try and keep mornings clear and hope that a number of them will actually be kept for some study. Uh, a lot goes on in the back of one's mind, I think, when in sermon preparation. So if I can get to the text early... On, you know, if I can read it on Monday and do a bit of grappling, and then it's turning over in the back of my mind, that's very, very helpful. Um, I, I find, you know, the more I go on, the less time I have, actually, for preaching, because life is so busy. And so probably one gets quicker, but I think in the early days, you know, you need to keep, you, for a sermon, do you need 15 hours? I mean, you need time. You really need time. And so you need to plan that and find it. But what I want to do is I want to get out the text as early as possible, and I want to have a couple of really good blocks of time in the week where I'm relatively undisturbed to really grapple with the text. I don't know if that's helpful. I have a question here the, online. 
if we consider Hebrews to be a single recorded sermon, a thesis I agree with, but in our current context and to our current congregations, we must exegete it over multiple weeks for it to be understood. What does, the in, uh, what does this indicate about the author's expectations of the original audience? What does this indicate about the state of the church today and about our sermons today? Mm, great, great questions. Those are very good questions. I mean, I think there are a few interesting things to think about there. You know, when I suggest we should talk about the who, what, where, why, and when, for the who with Hebrews, there are some things we must be able to say then about the addressees. Because if they could in any way engage with that sermon, they were highly biblically literate. I mean, it's, it's a huge um, cycle of exposition of Old Testament texts and themes and ideas. And so we are dealing with a highly biblically literate group of people who are grounded in the Old Testament scriptures. That's interesting. I think one of the things we need to reckon with is that, you know, first century society was an oral society with respect to learning and, you know, not necessarily always literate, but very, very used to listening and to taking in information by listening. We are not. So this occasion today, you know, stretches us because we're not used to lots and lots of talking and listening. We're a soundbite culture. We, you know, we tend to think that we need lots of other means of communication apart from spoken speech in order to learn and take in information. We need a strong visual element and so on. That was not the case in the ancient world. So I think trying to impose expectations in a sense on a modern group for what would have worked in, in terms of a discourse. But we don't know. I mean, obviously, I think it could, would have been possible for that to be delivered in one go, 40 minutes, read it out. But does that, would they not then have taken some time to digest and revisit what was there? I assume they must have. Right. I assume they must have. And so I don't think it's illegitimate for us to take a number of weeks in Hebrews to break it down. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if that's not legitimate, I feel I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Wasn't it Spurgeon who said something about uh, he was uh, freed from the idea of preaching through books? Because he had it happen, someone preached through Hebrews for uh, years, right? And uh, verse by verse, and he was bored at the end of it. So maybe that's why he was a textual preacher. Maybe. Um, yes, go ahead. Um, so your comment about preaching Christ from every text, okay? I love it, but I have seen it done in ways that actually I would say are destructive, mm. from the standpoint that. For instance, I'm teaching a course at our church right now on how to interpret the scriptures, teaching our people to study the word for themselves and how to do it. And one of the pastors that we looked at last night, and we were talking about context last night, and that was just simply in 1 Samuel 15, where Samuel is saying to Saul, go and kill everybody. And my concern would be is how do you caution or what would you say to someone who would want to take that and either spiritualize this or just kind of push the historical realities aside to, to just get to Christ. Yeah. And, and yeah. No, it's a great question. And I mean, it's not a one line answer for sure. It is true that often Old Testament preaching is done badly in either ignoring Christ, you know, if you preach it in such a way that, you know, a, a group of Jewish rabbis would listen to your sermon and think that was amazing, right? And would be saying amen at the end of it. You know, if, if you preach it simply as a Jewish sermon, you're missing something, right? Um, but, but it is possible as well to try and preach Christ in a way that is very clumsy or inaccurate um, or very, very boring. So, you know, as, as biblical theology as a discipline became more popularized over the last 20 years, I remember... You know, there was a phase in Britain where young theological students were getting the idea that you're meant to get to Christ. And, you know, you'd preach through, through judges, and basically with every chapter, it would be either good judge or bad judge. And Jesus is the judge like this, but better. Or Jesus is not a bad judge like this, and he's the judge we need. And every, everything was the same. You know, very, very boring, very, very flat line. And, you know, we need to think about the different ways in which the scriptures point to Christ. 
Sometimes an Old Testament text is used in the New Testament, and the New Testament gives us an authoritative read on how this text points to Christ. Sometimes it's very surprising how that's done. You know, we need to be thinking about the, off, the great offices in Israel, prophet, priest, and king, how all of them find fulfillment in Christ. And every you know, incumbent of the office along the way is in some way a pale reflection of Christ or a denial of Christ, but is, is taking us toward him. And then we think about some of the great, the great pictorial themes of you know, kingdom and temple and rest and some of these things, which the New Testament give us some guidance on how these point to Christ and find fulfillment in him. It's multifaceted, but I think what we really need is the encouragement to say it can be done well. You know, these are the scriptures that speak about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Like, let's, let's find Christ in the scriptures because they are, he's there. Um, but I quite agree it can be done badly. I, ju- I would just say it's not a reason not to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for today. I think I can say um, with everybody's agreement that there were moments where we could sense that everybody in the room was very moved by, uh, by things that you said. I go back to lecture one, um, and I was personally very moved by uh, what you said regarding the preaching of the word being like entering heaven or something mm. like that, mm. you know. Um, and I just, it caused me to wonder about one thing. Um, there are two parts to this. There are actors that are involved. There is the preacher, there is the congregation, and there is God ministering to people at, uh, at that time. And I couldn't help thinking about Isaiah 1. There are circumstances under which God turns away from his people because he finds what they are doing unacceptable, and all the reasons are in that passage. And I I reflected on some contemporary writings and teachings and practices in evangelicalism where it's very casual, and there's a desire to make things very comfortable. And it caused me to think about these two things. I believe I'm quoting John Piper correctly, or I'm paraphrasing him correctly by saying at one point he said, anything that happens on the platform that does not point toward Christ is idolatry. And so there's a sense in which there is a conduct for the preacher and for all that goes on up front that's important to liberating that spiritual activity uh, for going on. The second piece of that is the preparation of the congregation in coming in. And this is, I think, what is being addressed in in Isaiah 1. And, you know, a fear that in some way, shape, or form, we have come so far away from the reverence that enables the preaching ministry to have its full effect, um, that, that we almost need a reset in terms of what goes on on the platform and how we prepare ourselves for that as a congregation coming into that. Just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Oh, there's so much there, Peter. I think we could have many conversations surrounding those themes and those questions. I I mean, just initially, you know, it it is interesting. I think we had a, probably 20 years ago now, but we had a kind of major revolution with respect to kind of formality. I think... uh, in, in terms of congregational gatherings and Sundays and so on. And, and there was rightly, I think, a sense that we needed to set aside some stuffiness, perhaps, that, that acted as a barrier to others coming in and feeling like they could participate. But probably in, in some ways in which that revolution played out, there was a throwing out of the baby with the bathwater in terms of reverence in corporate worship and an understanding that there was a, a sacredness to our gathering and something theologically significant and meaningful to the gathering. And that's been very interesting in COVID, actually, because as we've come back together, and you'll all have had your experience in your churches, but coming back together, there have been some people who have said, you know, now that things are open up again and we're able to come back together, a number of people have said, well, I, I actually quite like church in my pajamas in my living room. You know, this has not been a problem for me. 
I'm fine. And it, it, that sense and those responses have required us to be able to articulate, well, what is it that is special about gathering together? Why do we do it? And what does this mean? And at the Met, we've had to do that. And actually, we've pointed the congregation, among other places, to Hebrews 12 and said there is something of a sense here that as we gather on earth, we are participating and mirroring something profoundly wonderful in the heavenlies. And we need to have a sense of wonder about that. And we need to recognize that the forsaking of the gathering in Hebrews, there's a reason why Hebrews cares about this. It's a letter as a document. You know, it, it is mandated and important because it is a, essential to who we are in Christ as an assembled people. So I think in terms of preparing the congregation, actually giving a theological vision for what it is to gather and why it matters, I think is very, very significant. But the reality is, just to you, finally, to one of the comments you made in terms of the fear that the Lord might remove his blessing. I mean, I, I think all the time with my ministry and with our church life, the Lord would be entirely within his rights to remove his blessing. <laughs> You know, and I just think all the time, we just rest on the grace of God. We don't deserve his blessing. And we need to have a fearful sense that he is kinder to us than we deserve. And day by day and week by week, if he is blessing, and if he is present among us by his spirit, that is, that is his kindness entirely and nothing of our deserving. And a fearful sense of that, I think, is a guard for us. But a, pre, a, a kind of presumption that waltzes into the presence of God and, and assumes that all should be well. Um, apart from his grace, of course, is a dangerous thing. There's lots more there, Peter, but yeah. I think we'll, oh, okay, one more. Go ahead, Jim. Jim. Thank you, Dr. Griffiths. I just have a, a quick question about the uh, analogy that you draw a line and then the line of uh, doctrine orthodoxy. I really like the idea and see a lot of things happen because people go over and getting legalistic or go under uh, more liberalistic. Uh, I would just want to pick up from your brain that how would you help people um, that either or, like standing either over the line or under the line, because at that point it becomes more like just not cognitive legalism, but they kind of like um, embodied as their identity became legalistic or like liberalistic. And but by the time it's more complicated and just like cognitive reorientation, but of our identity pretty much identify with that. It's a great question, and I think addressing our imbalances in our own disposition theologically is a bit of a life journey. The line thing is really a diagnostic, I find. But I have found, I've used it a bit with students, and I have found that the diagnostic causes some light bulbs to go on over time. You think, yeah, I think my tendency is always to look at the text of Scripture and to think, how can I dip below so to avoid offense? That's Actually, that's a pattern of thought. Or how can I take this and go further so that I can prove that I'm really zealous? That's a pattern of thought. That's not healthy. And, and so the diagnostic is, help, is helpful. It's not the solution, but I would commend the diagnostic to you as a starting point. Yeah, thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much for all of your It has been a great privilege and a real joy. I'm grateful to have oh, been able to be you. here. Thank you. I am glad. Okay, just to close out our time, we have a, a ministry leadership day coming up next March, at the end of March, and we originally were hoping that Al Mohler would be here. He has since canceled on us, and so we are going to have Bruce Cleminger from the Evangelical Fellowship. So that, he will be bringing some of the hot items that are going on in our time to us and how we can navigate through them. So please come. Let me just close in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you that you called us to preach your word. We thank you for using Dr. Griffiths today to help us and stimulate us in our thinking about preaching. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to keep Christ central. And we pray that you will be glorified in our preaching ministry, even this Lord's Day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.